Assemblyman Lowe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you very much for allowing me to present Assembly Bill 883. This bill simply prohibits employers from publishing or posting a job advertisement that disqualifies an applicant who is currently or was one point a public employee. Recently, there have been uh, disturbing trends whereby public employees are adversely impacted for certain job opportunities simply because holding employment within the public sector. Generally, those being discriminated against are applicants who were public employees before pension reform occurred and thus are eligible to receive more money in retirement. I work closely with this committee to carefully craft this bill to avoid any of the unintended consequences that I oftentimes talk about or related to employers. Uh, if a job requires a particular degree or license, then it goes without saying that the employer has the full right to make a decision based on that criteria. Uh, with me today is Christy Bomo with the California Professional Firefighters. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Christy Baumer representing the California Professional Firefighters. We are pleased to be sponsors of this measure as we had several locals bring actual job announcements to our attention um, that basically said, notwithstanding your commitment to your public service, long time serving your communities as firefighters, um, you need not apply in our jurisdiction. We're not that interested in that um, training or experience or um, protection in our community. So it seemed appropriate and we thank the assembly member for introducing this measure. Uh, as he mentioned, this does not in any way obstruct the, an employer's ability to screen applicants and determine uh, an employee's fitness for duty. It only says you can't shut the door on their ev even ap applying for the job because they have a status as a current or former public employee. Uh, don't punish my members for their long pr public service allow them to continue to serve. We urge your I vote. Thank you. Next point is. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. Um, clearly this kind of discrimination doesn't make any sense uh, in terms of the perspective of the community or the taxpayers. You want people um, in these jobs who believe in public service and who have experience in public service. So to have these kind of discriminatory policies not only harms the workers, it harms those who are depending on local agencies to provide services. Um, so we're here in strong support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, member says our deals on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, being that we're partners with the California Professional Firefighters and uh, anything that deals with apprenticeship, we know full well the high level of training that they receive. I think it's unfair that they would be discriminated against uh, for their public service and looking for other employment. For those reasons, we support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Monaghan on behalf of the California State Pipe Trades Council, the California State Association of Electrical Workers, and the Western States Council of Sheet Metal Workers in support. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members, Shane Gussman on behalf of the Teamsters, the Amalgamated Transit Union, the Machinists, and IFPT Local 21 in support. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members, Tristan Brown of the California School Employees Association also in support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time I'd like to uh, ask if there's anyone else wishing to speak in support of the bill. Hearing and seeing none, this time we, at this time we'll call up uh, or call forward the opposition. Uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Jennifer Burr on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, and we are opposed to AB 883. Although the bill does not explicitly state that we are prevented from uh, inquiring into an applicant's background, uh, we do believe that this will actually be the effect of the bill. Um, unlike other protected classifications in California law, such as age, marital status, or religion, that we really don't have to ask about when we're interviewing you for the job, um, and can easily navigate away from when we're questioning an applicant, inquiring into somebody's work history History is a very relevant and direct question that we actually want to know about before we hire an applicant. And if we ask about your work history and we discover that either you're currently or you were formerly a public employee, we have just learned basically a protected information. And if we don't hire you, there's an automatic chance. I won't say automatic, but there's a good chance uh, that we have a discrimination case on our hand because we've made an adverse employment issue potentially on your status as a public employee. Now, whether or not that uh, discrimination case is ultimately successful is not necessarily the point from our concern. We try to avoid litigation at all times, um, and we, that's why we try to avoid learning any of this protected information in an employment interview. This isn't something that we can navigate away from. It's not something that we can choose not to ask about your work history when we're interviewing you for a job, and so we are concerned 
concern that would essentially put an employer in an unwinnable uh, situation. We either don't ask about your uh, work history because we don't want to find out whether or not you were a former or current public employee and we forgo the opportunity to investigate you before we hire you with a potential negligent hiring claim against us on the back end or we ask about it we find out you're a public employee and whether or not we hire you could lead to a discrimination lawsuit. Um, we haven't heard of any examples in the private sector of where discrimination against a public employee is actually an issue or where there's ever been an example that a, a private sector employer has denied somebody employment based upon their uh, public employee status and so we're concerned that we're just opening up additional avenues of litigation against a pub, uh, private sector employer for discrimination that hasn't happened. That concern was elevated by the inclusion of a private right of action in the bill with treble damages for uh, violating this section and so we're concerned on that basis. I do want to mention that uh, we have raised our concerns to Assemblymember Lowe's office and staff and they have um, encouraged us in the fact that they're willing to work on a lot of these issues and we're happy to work with them as this bill potentially moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Mr. Mr. Chair, members, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the Civil Justice Association of California. I'd like to echo Ms. Uh, Barrera's comments and uh, our concern fundamentally is uh, the private right of action on page 3 lines 25 to 33 in the subdivision D. Uh, besides the private right of action of course as you're familiar with Mr. Chair uh, violations of the labor code are already subject to the private attorneys general act under 2698 of the uh, uh, labor code and so we think the secondary private right of action ought to be struck and I appreciate that the uh, author has indicated there are some disturbing trends and uh, Ms. Bauma cited uh, some advertisements that have been raised at her local level uh, but we're not aware of any instances in which the in which private employers are implicated and so we would pose the question as to whether uh, private employers need to be included uh, in this particular bill. Thank you. Next witness, please. Nicole Rice, California. There we go. Nicole Rice, California Manufacturers and Technology Association. I'll just echo the concerns that Ms. Barrera and Mr. McKaylee raised as to the reasoning for private employers uh, being in the bill. It seems like from the testimony and conversations we, we have also had with the author's office that there's a particular issue that needs to be addressed and the bill we feel is just a little too broad to capture instances that we aren't convinced that there's a challenge in the private sector to deal with. So we're happy to work with the author's office as well and hope we can come to a resolution on this. But currently we're opposed. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to add on in opposition to the bill? Hearing and seeing none. Members of the committee, any questions or comments? Mr. McCarty? Mm -hmm. Bill moved by Mr. Uh, Assembly Member oh. Assembly Member uh, Bill moved by Assembly Member McCarty, seconded by Assembly Member Chu. Assembly Member Patterson, would you like to make a so I appreciate also the fact that uh, those who've been in opposition have expressed uh, uh, that you have an open door. And uh, I, I am uh, going to abstain presently, um, uh, but I would certainly reserve the right at a later date when it comes uh, maybe to the floor or to other places. I would very much hope uh, that you could accommodate the uh, specified concerns that were raised here, because uh, if you can do that, I would love to be able to join in the vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lowe, would you like to respond? Yeah, simply put, uh, thank you very much, Assemblyman Patterson, uh, for um, those comments. Obviously, I come from Silicon Valley, and so the unintended consequences is always something that I take a look at. And so, as you've heard, I'm uh, very much committed to not only working with your office, but also those stakeholders involved to be able to address some of these issues as we move forward. Thank you. Assemblyman Lowe, uh, would you also like to close? And with that, I respectfully ask for your I vote. Very good. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Lowe, uh, for bringing this matter forward. I haven't heard of it being a prolific matter, but I, I know that you're trying to nip it in the bud. Uh, I also know that uh, there are some people that do uh, denigrate and disparage public employees, and that's really unfortunate. Uh, uh, for the vast majority of the public employees that I've had the pleasure of meeting, they're real, true, hardworking folks that uh, really uh, epitomize the the, the, the epitome of public service. They, they want to serve, they want to provide uh, for the community and give back. So I appreciate you standing up for them. Uh, I also think that uh, someone's employment status formally as a public employee should never be used against them in an adverse way. So with that, Madam Secretary, uh, please call the vote. 
Motion is due pass to appropriations. Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Harper? No. Harper, no. Chu? Aye. Chu, aye. Low? Aye. Low, aye. McCarty? Aye. McCarty, aye. Patterson? Yeah. Patterson, not voting. <laughs> Thurman? Aye. That bill is out. Thurman said aye. Thurman, oh. aye. That bill is out, sir. Congratulations, this is number low. Looks like we have our last uh, bill on the docket. The chairman will sub subsequently uh, lift calls. Chairman Hernandez, AB 621. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce Assembly Bill 621. Uh, 621 will transform and modernize port drayage operations by providing a limited opportunity for amnesty for motor carriers that come forward and correctly classify their drivers as employees rather than independent contractors. As members of this committee know all too well, there has been a serious problem with the misclassification of port truck drivers over the past few decades. This committee has held four oversight hearings on this issue over the last decade, the most recent being this last June. This, the bill represents a common sense compromise in allowing the parties to come together, rectify the situation, and move forward in a productive manner. Under AB 621, port drayage companies will be provided an opportunity to voluntarily come forward to participate in a limited amnesty program by entering into a consent decree with the Labor Commissioner. Under the terms of the consent decree, the motor carrier must agree to pay all wages and benefits owed to previously misclassified independent contractors and all taxes owed to the state as a result of such misclassification. In addition, the company must agree to classify any present or future commercial drivers as employees. In exchange, a motor carrier that enters into such a consent decree will be relieved of liability for statutory or civil penalties based on previous misclassification of drivers. AB 621 is an important first step in the industry's effort to modernize and improve efficiency at our ports, which represents a vital component of our state and federal economy. The industry itself is beginning to recognize that in adopting an employee model and working together with drivers, organized labor, and the ports, they will be able to improve intermodal transportation and remain, remain viable well into the future. AB 621 will enable motor carriers in the drayage industry to make the right decision for the benefit of all interested stakeholders. I have with me Mr. Shane Gusman on behalf of the California Teamsters to speak in support of this bill. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Shane Gusman on behalf of the Teamsters Public Affairs Council, um, we are in strong support of this bill. Misclassification has plagued our ports for decades, as was pointed out by the chairman, and um, we have tried every which way to resolve this problem in the ports with legislative proposals. And in our view, the tide is starting to turn. We are getting enforcement actions. Um, we are getting lawsuits. And over and over and over again, those lawsuits, those enforce, enforcement actions are coming down on the side of employees, that those drivers are misclassified and they're employees. And while we think that that's great, that ultimately, in our view, most of those drivers are employees, we don't want to wait until years and years of litigation go by to get those folks the benefits and the back wages that they deserve. So in, in our view, Assemblymember Hernandez's bill is a unique uh, sort of compromise that gets those workers their wages, gets the state the tax money that it's owed, and relieves employers of liability going forward. And this is not a small amount of liability. Um, as the analysis points out, in the enforcement actions that have taken place, there have been 62, on average, $62,000 per employee in penalties that um, are being assessed to employers who have mis misclassified drivers. This is a significant amount of money for employers. And so we think this is a reasonable compromise for all parties involved. Um, I would point out, this is a voluntary program. No one has to do it. Um, it's simply if you're an employer and you think you have engaged in misclassification or you are unsure and you're worried about your liability going forward, this is a, a tool for you to avoid those costs. 
Now, I know we have some opposition to the bill. Um, I have a great deal res of respect for the opponents. However, I am perplexed by their opposition because, as I said, this is a voluntary program. No employer has to do it. Um, if they think they're not misclassifying, even though all these folks are losing their cases down in the ports, they can roll the dice and see where the liability is. No one's making them do this under this bill. If they have an issue with the labor commissioner, that's not what this bill's about. This bill is about this voluntary compromise. Um, if they have uh, some things that they want to do, they can run another bill. But this bill is about resolving a problem in the ports for the workers. Um, so we urge your I vote. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation, also here in support. The misclassification of workers as independent contractors is one of the most serious problems we face in trying to protect workers' rights. Not only does that mean that that worker loses out on every form of worker protection that we fight for here, including the right to get unemployment benefits if they get laid off, uh, workers' compensation if they're injured on the job, wage and hour protections, but also this kind of widespread misclassification makes it impossible for employers to compete if they follow the law. It creates uh, such an unfair playing field where these employers are able to save so much because they are not providing workers compensation or having to pay overtime to those workers that those who are trying to follow the law can't compete. That is an unsustainable situation. It also deprives the state of tax revenue. Um, and, and so it's incredibly important that we figure out how to address a, all misclassification, but particularly where we've seen entire industries flip from an employee model to a misclassification model. Just to reiterate, this is a voluntary program. I cannot imagine why any employer would come up here and impose the ability of some employers to choose to get out of facing penalties if they simply follow the law and reclassify workers. This bill does nothing to any employer that does not choose to voluntarily reclassify employees. Everyone else is left untouched and can maintain business as usual. So we're here in strong support. We think this is an incredibly important program. Thank you very much. Are there any, uh, t is there any testimony uh, for opponents? What the? Okay. Uh, Go Mr. ahead. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman and, and members, Kelly Jensen representing the California Trucking Association. Uh, we are opposed to the bill. We did not come to this position lightly, uh, and we very much appreciate the, uh, the chairman's effort uh, and his sponsor's effort and acknowledgement uh, of the complexities of classification issues. Um, we have a long history of trying to work with the Teamsters and, and the chairman on, on these issues. The committee analysis does an excellent job articulating these complexities especially in the ports and the dredge industry. And there's a, a reason the bill is focused on this industry. Um, most um, notably, the, slow, the labor slowdown um, affecting cargo movement uh, was very difficult for the trucking industry to absorb. Um, and, uh, you know, so those are issues that are always present, um, hours of operation at the ports and other issues. Um, that we as an industry have to have to work with. Um, in the end, the trucking industry spent a lot of time um, on this, and you know, came to this position because we do not believe the bill provides any meaningful liability protection, and it does not address any of the issues of selective enforcement um, by the labor commissioner um, on these on these issues. Obviously, we'll, we will continue to work uh, if the bill moves forward today with the sponsors and, and the chairman uh, to address um, these issues. I have with me uh, Mr. Bob Jones, um, the former special counsel for the labor agency to address some specific provisions of the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as Mr. Jensen just explained, we're here today because DLSE has elected to force motor carriers to reclassify independent owner operators as employees. And they've uh, elected to do this through the use of a wage claim process, adjudication process, which is an individual by individual process. 
The wage claim process has never been used by any former labor commissioners of which I am aware or any administrations uh, for, for, this, for this purpose and in this manner. This puts additional, uh, unreasonable additional uh, pressure upon motor carriers to agree to reclassify uh, motor car uh, excuse me, independent uh, contractors, uh, owner operators as employees even though they don't believe that that is appropriate and that the courts ultimately want, will decide whether that's appropriate or not. However, by using the wage claim adjudication process to force uh, carriers to do this uh, reclassification, uh, the, these issues are not getting addressed um, by courts of record so that we can finally get this uh, issue uh, resolved. Um, it's ex using the wage claim adjudication process is not only extremely co costly because it requires an, it, hearings for each individual employee and you've got, you could have a, a motor carrier that has um, 50 owner operators, he's going to have, that's going to have to be heard by the labor commissioner on a case by case basis and there have to be a hearing on a case-by-case -case basis and the determinations that are made in those hearings uh, don't have any precedential effect upon the issue that's in question. So this is basically a process that's being misused and I think for uh, improper purposes. There is a, a procedure, an entirely different statutory provision for the Labor Commissioner to try to get these cases resolved. These are complex cases. Every labor commissioner has realized and recognized uh, in the past that the best way to handle a complex case where you have a systemic violation is to take it either through a civil procedure and the labor commissioner has a staff of attorneys to handle that or to use the other statutory process that's available which is the Bureau of Field Enforcement. The Bureau of Field Enforcement has investigators who are trained deputy labor commissioners who are investigators, auditors, uh, hearing officers, and um, attorneys that are assigned to investigate these types of alleged violations on an employer by employer basis, not on an employee by employee basis. And in fact, by use of the BOFI process, the Bureau of Field Enforcement process, the labor commissioner then goes in and in one case determines the rights of all the employees because the wage claim process does not do that. And this is the process that's been used by all the labor commissioners in the past where you have multiple claims filed, identical claims filed. And the purpose is that we've always, we had when I was the acting labor commissioner, is to pre prevent the waste of the labor commissioner's resources in having to adjudicate four, five, six hundred individual claims without getting a resolution that would in fact uh, be precedent setting. Thank you. Sorry, that's, that's time. Uh, are there any, is there any other additional testimony? Are there any other folks wishing to uh, add on to state uh, support uh, or opposition uh, additionally beyond the testimony? Okay. Uh, with that, any uh, comments or questions from uh, from committee members? Move the bill. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, are there any further questions? Uh, I do. Um, one of the questions that I have is in regards to what this would accomplish. Is my understanding is that this bill provides a limited liability uh, relief on penalties assessed by the labor commissioner, uh, but yet. Uh, individual in question or a company in question uh, could still have liability from other state agencies. Uh, is there room for this bill to be expanded to be able to provide actual full amnesty from all state prosecution or? Uh, if you can help me in clarifying the question in terms of what other liability you'd be talking about and what other agencies would be appropriate or be uh, relevant Whether, whether it's through the courts or whether it's through any other agency, it, you know, it, does this bill provide a full amnesty? It, it, maybe, maybe it does, and maybe I'm not reading into it correctly because that's what I'm, what I'm trying to assess. I'd like to defer to Mr. Guessman. Uh, Assembly member, the, the vast majority of uh, penalties are wage and hour penalties, and that's what we're talking about in this bill. Um, if there are uh, some other penalties that you're referring to, I think, you know, 
we are happy to look at those, but I, I think that what we are concerned with and what we are trying to relieve the employees of liability for are wage and hour penalties, which are substantial if you have not paid wages for going back to the statute of limitations. I understand in terms of the wage and uh, penalties, but are there no other agencies or could a, a determination be found from the courts to additionally find against the employer or against the business outside? Well, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure what what court would find their would find liability since this would be they would be entering a consent decree with the labor commissioner. So to resolve this dispute, would there be additional uh, liability in terms of uh, the employer with the federal government? Uh, again, I think the same answer would uh, would apply to that same matter. And 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 it, if you're if you're talking about penalties that may be issued by a taxing agency like EDD, those penalties are referred to in the bill. Okay. We really are trying to create an amnesty uh, opportunity for the employer um, because this problem is very widespread. We know that to rely on the court system to uh, litigate these cases uh, would uh, be almost insurmountable. And uh, the, on both sides of the aisle on this issue, uh, folks know that there's a big problem there with misclassification. And a lot of truck, trucking companies are already moving in the, in the right direction, corrective direction, uh, but many have not. And we're trying to create an opportunity for those that have not to do so in a way that they can evade, uh, not evade, but um, do it in a way to, uh, to handle, do the right thing, and, and not be charged with fines and penalties. It is voluntary. They don't have to do it, but uh, I have full faith that the Labor Commissioner today can handle these complex matters. Uh, she has proven and demonstrated that she has that capacity. Uh, perhaps in the past, the previous commissioners <clears throat> have found it too onerous, but it, this is within her domain, so let's, uh, let's allow her to act within the capacity and jurisdiction of her department. Uh, furthermore, uh, we know that most of these uh, truck drivers are very low wage workers. They don't have attorneys on retainer. And so their opportunity to an avenue to justice is almost unrealistic. And that's why uh, I think this state is very fortunate to have the labor commissioner that is an advocate for those that don't necessarily have legal representation but do have uh, an unjust cause that they're, they're fighting to uh, mitigate. Are there any further questions or comments from uh, members of the committee? Just one, just quickly follow up. I, would, would the members of the opposition uh, at least give a, a, a brief response to the, to the line of questioning that Mr. Harper uh, outlined? Because I'm a little unclear of what precisely I heard. Well, it, it should probably be limited to the chair in, in, this, in this question. Mr. Patterson, would you like to repeat the question? I understand. Um, goes back. I, it does go back to an earlier conversation. I, I, that we I, had. I think. I, I, I think probably the the, que the question is, is, in terms of having an answer for the question that I had asked, uh, perhaps the member doesn't find the clarity, and I'm I'm still struggling with the clarity. So, if there's anything else that you can do to further qu uh, clarify whether we really have a true amnesty or whether it is filled with additional uh, situations where there's significant liability, whether it's from other state agencies, courts, or the federal government. It, the, the bill, Mr. Chairman, the bill refers to all statutory penalties, so that would be other state agencies as well, if that helps clarify. I think probably at this point I'd probably say, at least speaking for myself, there's still a significant doubt in regards to that uh, that full amnesty. It's probably just best to leave it at that at that question. Uh, seeing no further, oh, does can say request? Okay, we have a motion. Okay, we have a motion, a second already, uh, and so with that, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote, uh, Madam Secretary. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me first let. Did you want any further co uh, comments to close? Just very briefly, this is really uh, an opportunity to give both parties, both sides, the opportunity to rectify an issue uh, and, and avoid costly litigation and fines. Uh, a word, this is a, a pro-business, pro-labor uh, proposal here today, and I'm hopeful that we can have bipartisan support. Thank you very much. And let's go ahead, Madam Secretary, with the vote. Motion is due pass to appropriations. Hernandez? Aye. 
And then there's I, Harper. No. Harper, no. Chu? Aye. Chu, I, low. Aye. Low, I, McCarty. Patterson? No. Patterson, no. Thurman? Aye. Thurman, aye. That bill is out. Okay, that uh, bill moves out of committee, and uh, with that, uh, the chairman shall return. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. We only have two bills on call. Uh, Madam Secretary, you'll please uh, take those bills up at this time. AB 852, Burke. Absent members, Low. Aye. Low, aye. Thurman? Aye. Thurman, aye. That bill is out, sir. That bill is out. Second bill on call. AB 970, Nazarian. Absent members, Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Thurman? Aye. Thurman, aye. That bill is out. I think Mr. McCarty also may want to add on. He's coming. Okay. Mr. McCarty. Mr. McCarty would like to add on. Is Mr. McCarty anywhere near? Well, we can hold the roll open for the next three minutes. I know he's a sprinter, an athlete. He can make it here.